Honorable Congresswoman Tammy Duckworth, Democrat from the 8th District, joins me. And Congresswoman, welcome back to politics tonight. It's great to be on again, Paul. So, first of all, let's explain for those who may not know what have happened. I've just said rates have doubled. That indeed really did happen today, right? It sure did. They went from 3.4 to 6.8 percent. So those students who are getting um, student loans from now on will be paying double the interest rate. And so obviously one will have to blame Congress because Congress didn't take a vote. Who gets the blame for this one? Uh, did John Boehner not call it to the floor for a vote? Where does the blame go? Well, the blame goes right now to the minority of the Republicans who um, refuse to come up with a cap. The president and the Senate actually agreed on um, uh, a fix to this, which is to um, uh, tie it to market rates or interest rates. That means that the interest rates would raise and at least have a cap so that they can't go above a certain percent. Um, unfortunately, uh, we have a, a group of Republicans in the House who refuse to put a cap. And the problem with that is if you once you tied in student loan interest rates to a certain rate and then you don't put a cap on it, it could go up above 8 percent. And we don't want students paying that kind of a rate. And indeed, it's just not a, it's not a Democrat versus Republican thing here, too. Right. Because the White House is actually more in line with the moderate Republican position here. The White House certainly is more in line with the moderate Republican position. Um, I personally think that supporting student loans is a way that we can invest in our nation and investing in our future. So I don't even have a, I don't have a problem with keeping them lower than the market rate um, because it is an investment. These students who get this education will pay back far more in their productivity over their lifetime if they have these degrees and if they did not. Now, one argument I've heard some of your colleagues say is, you know, the banks are getting uh, rates at a, at a lower percentage than all of this. If we can give banks that rate, why not give students that rate? Of course, one argument there is perhaps banks are a, a safer investment and maybe larger investments for the, the country. Is that a viable argument? You know, Paul, I don't think that's a viable argument. Um, student loans is um, students are not allowed to um, enter into bankruptcy with student loans. So you will pay your student loans back. It might take you 20, 30, 40 years, um, but you will pay it back. Um, the government is making a huge profit on student loans. Um, it's literally in the tens of billions of dollars that we make back as taxpayers from the interest that we charge students for the loans that they get for their education. Now, of course, Congress always takes everything to the 11th hour here. They've gone past the midnight hour, if you will. But they can undo this, correct, after the 4th of July break? Absolutely. Congress, at the very least, should be putting forward um, a stopgap measure, a temporary uh, freezing of the rate, keeping it at 3.4% while we work out a deal. Um, I hope Speaker Boehner will do that. Um, if he puts something up, even if it is temporary, uh, while we work out a deal, I'll vote for it because we have to support our students. And is it your expectation that the minority of Republicans who were creating this problem in the first place won't be enough to stop that kind of fix? I, I really hope not. I really hope that they won't be able to stop it, Paul. I mean, this is really just common sense. This is going to cost you know, our students thousands of dollars at a time when our economy is just starting to grow again. You know, we want kids to enter the workforce with all of the training that they need to be competitive, not just here, but internationally. And I just can't see that, you know, why anybody would want to stand in the way of that. Uh, well, I agree with you on that. Now, the immigration bill is coming your way. The Senate passed it, not at the numbers they had hoped for, but still significant numbers. Uh, and yet the House, uh, House of Republican leadership doing a lot of squawking, saying we're not going to debate the Senate bill. We're going to do our own thing and we're going to take it, as Congressman Peter Roskam says, in bits and pieces. What's your thought about that? It, to me, it sounds like get ready for nothing to happen. Again, dead on the money there, Paul. <laughs> uh, let me tell you, everybody that I talked to, I, I had um, a, a roundtable recently on immigration, and we have 38 organizations there, ranging from the conservative chambers of commerce all the way through to the ACLU. And every single one of my constituencies have said, please do comprehensive. Don't do it piecemeal. Please do a comprehensive bill. This is what we need. Um, and this piecemeal of, uh, approach is just, it's, it's a setup to make sure that um, all of the pieces, you know, are voted against and don't pass and then nothing happens. Well, of course, some things might pass, like a border plan or something like that, but if it passed the House and went back to the Senate, my guess is Harry Reid wouldn't bring it up because he'd say, we've already dealt with that. That's exactly what the Senate would do, absolutely. That's why we need to pass a comprehensive bill. There's a great one that um, the, you know, it's not, it's not everybody's going to be happy with it, but that's what the nature of compromise, but there's a bill that both Republicans and Democrats in the House have agreed to. And now we just got to keep this minority group and the, you know, the ultra-conservative Republicans who are stopping everything from happening. They need to allow this to come up for a vote. And then we can go into conference. 
and work out the differences between the House and the Senate bill. Do, do you have some hope? I mean, as much as we both said, it looks like it's going nowhere. But when push comes to shove, do you think the leadership will move off it? And the reason I say that is because Republicans know very well if they don't have some kind of shift when it comes to the Latino vote, uh, they're never going to win in 14 or 16 in those elections. They know that. They've got to do something. You know, I think, Paul, if we can show that the piecemeal approach won't work, if they try to bring it up piecemeal and everything fails, um, that they might try the comprehensive plan. Uh, that's sort of what happened with the Violence Against Women Act. They brought up the re their, um, House Republican version, which was atrocious. It could not pass, and then they, that only then did they bring up the Senate version, and we passed the Violence Against Women Act. So maybe, you know, we got to allow them to go through the gyrations of the piecemeal approach before we do the Senate. But right. I think this is too important too important an issue to be playing these political games with. Um, uh, something that didn't pass last week, it was absolutely fascinating, the farm bill. There's always a farm bill. It always passes. It did not pass. This time around, it got all wrapped up with food stamps um, for people in need, and it didn't pass, and Eric Cantor made his way to the podium and blamed Republicans, to which, of course, Denny Hoyer, uh, the Democratic leader, <laughs> said, hey, don't look at us. What really went on there? Well, so I was one of those Democrats that was going to vote for the farm bill. I am, after all, from a farm state. Yeah. Uh, and uh, on that last day, in those last hours, they managed to push me away from voting for the farm bill. It was atrocious in that it had $20 billion in cuts to the food stamp program. But then they started adding really obnoxious requirements. And Eric Cantor is one of the culprits in this. His bill that he, the bill that he pushed was going to require you to be working in order to obtain food stamps. Now, my dad had lost his job in his 50s, and we were on food stamps. And the reason we were on food stamps was because he'd lost his job. So to say that if you don't have a job, you can't get food stamps is idiocy. You know, these people are on food stamps because they have a hard time finding work or they're underemployed. And some would uh, ask, why do those two things even go together? Why is the, the, the farm bill tied up with the food stamp program? They're separate issues. Well, 80% of the farm bill is actually supplemental nutrition programs, uh, the food stamps or the women, infant, and children programs. You know, the way I see it is we needed a farm bill. Our farmers really were hurt last year, 35% crop failures here in Illinois. I wanted to vote for it. I, was, I have told my leadership that I was yeah. going to vote for it that morning. But by the end of the afternoon, because of all of these uh, really atrocious amendments that they added, I ended up having to vote against it because... Um, you know, it's about protecting children who are hungry. Yeah, and I'm sure that issue is not over. It's going to come back on. One final thing to talk to you about, uh, and it's an Illinois state issue, of course, the notion of same-sex marriage. You know, I, was, I had the pleasure of being on the WGN float yesterday in the Pride Parade. And, uh, Yay, you! And, and it was, I mean, there was literally a million people, as far as the eye could see, and uh, a lot of legislators there all wearing shirts that said, I'm a yes vote. Um, what message do you have to the legislators in Springfield who seem to be, uh, you know, as a group, afraid to take that step and, and uh, allow same-sex marriage in Illinois? I think the message we have to send them is we've got your back. Um, the people who are opposed to same-sex marriage, to equal marriage, do a much better job of intimidating and protesting and calling in and sending letters into legislators so they may have a skewed view of the support for um, equal marriage. And, in fact, the majority of people here in Illinois support equal marriage, and we just need to move forward with this. I think any time two consenting adults want to pledge a lifetime commitment to each other, we're all better off for it. Well, the Supreme Court obviously stepped in to support that position last week with its decisions. Congresswoman Tammy Duckworth of the 8th District, always a pleasure to talk to you. Have a wonderful and safe 4th of July holiday. As always, thank you for your service to the country and your military role as well, and we'll talk to you soon.